Welcome everyone. I'm Andrew Saas, Emeritus Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of California at Santa Cruz. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. This is the third event in a series called Inspiring Change in Times of Crisis, Conversations that Matter with Right Livelihood Award Laureates, co-hosted by Right Livelihood Foundation, and UC Santa Cruz. Uh, thank you to friends of the Wright Livelihood Foundation and the Wright Livelihood College, and especially to David Shaw, who's the coordinator of the Wright Livelihood College at UC Santa Cruz, and to Stina Thanner from Wright Livelihood Foundation. If you have any questions uh, during this webinar for our panelists, uh, please email us anytime at rlc-webinar at ucsc.edu. So let me repeat that, rlc-webinar at ucsc.edu. And please visit rightlivelihood.ucsc.edu or rightlivelihoodaward.org to sign up for our mailing list to receive information about our future events. We also uh, encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube to be notified as we post more videos from this series. The next event uh, for your information will be next week, May 13th, with the topic of Current Threats to Democracy, featuring Francis Moore LaPay from the US, Vesna Terselic from Croatia, and Elizabeth Beaumont UC Santa Cruz acting as the moderator. So let's get started. The theme of today's discussion is water. Water contaminated by toxic chemical wastes, hundreds of millions of the world's peoples living without access to minimum necessary quantities of clean water. These were grave, immense issues long before the coronavirus pandemic arrived. Now with the pandemic raging globally, we are uh, faced with new questions. Do these pre-existing conditions, the polluted waters, the lack of access make the pandemic worse? Uh, conversely, will the pandemic affect society's future ability or willingness to improve access and quality? These are the kinds of questions we will be exploring in this webinar with two Right Livelihood laureates, Maud Barlow and Robert Ballot. Let me introduce our two guests, two speakers today. Maud Barlow received the Right Livelihood Award in 2005, quote, for her exemplary and longstanding worldwide work for trade justice and the recognition of the fundamental human right to water. Maud is the national chairperson of the Council of Canadians and chairs Food and Water Watches Board. She's also an executive member of the San Francisco based International Forum on Globalization and a counselor with the Hamburg based World Futures Council. Maud is the recipient of eight honorary doctorates. She is the recipient of many awards, in fact, in addition to the Right Livelihood Award, including the Citation of Lifetime Achievement at the 2008 Canadian Environmental Awards and the 2009 Earth Day Canada Outstanding Environmental Achievement Award. In 2008-2009, she served as Senior Advisor on Water to the 63rd President of the UN General Assembly. She is also a best-selling author and also co-author of 16 books, including Blue Future, Protecting Water for People and the Planet Forever, and Blue Covenant, 
the global water crisis and the coming battle for the right to water. And turning to our second speaker today, Robert Balot. Uh, Robert received the Right Livelihood Award in 2017. Quote, for exposing a decades long history of chemical pollution, winning long sought justice for the victims and setting a precedent for effective regulation of hazardous substances. Uh, Robert is one of the world's most important environmental lawyers with a combination of innovative ideas and in litigation, scientific understanding, and extraordinary perseverance. He has achieved one of the most significant victories for environmental law and corporate accountability in this century. In a legal battle lasting 19 years, he represented 70,000 citizens whose drinking water had been contaminated with perfluoroanic acid, PFOA, as it's popularly known, uh, produced by the chemical giant DuPont. Expanding upon the concept of class action litigation, he set up a seven-year toxicological study of the 70,000 victims, a study which contributed significantly the scientific understanding of the global health risks associated with polyfluoroalkyl substances, uh, more often known as PFAS. This class of substances, which does not break down in the environment or the human body, uh, is ubiquitous in our societies today. At a time when environmental regulation is under serious threat of being watered down in the United States and elsewhere, Balat successfully won compensation for his clients and continues to call for better regulation of toxic substances. So Maud, Robert, welcome to the webinar. Uh, let's start with statements from each of you. Uh, and I want to ask, just to get us started, how does your work relate to the webinar theme of water? And how has the pandemic affected how you think about your environmental activism? Uh, Maud? Well, thank you very much, um, Andy and David and Stina and the Right Livelihood. And big shout out to Robert. Um, just a pleasure to be doing this with you. And hello to everybody out there. <clears throat> I know these are challenging and difficult times, and I'm deeply grateful um, to have an opportunity to be part of this, because I think the, the more we can talk, the more we can share, um, the more we sh share the, the burden, if you will, and, and the more likely we're going to come to a better world when, as, as, as some sign says, uh, we're not going back to normal because normal was the problem in the first place. So, um, so thank you for the, those questions. I've been working on the global water crisis for many years. Um, it basically has two faces. One is the human face and one is the ecological face. We are a people who have been careless with water. We have mismanaged and <clears throat> polluted and diverted and overextracted and dammed our rivers to, to death and so on. And so we know that by 2025, the UN tells us that two thirds of us are going to be living in water stressed areas of the world. Already 2 billion people every day are forced to drink contaminated water because they don't have the money to pay for anything else. And I think it's important to note that it's not just in the global south. One recent year in the United States, there were 15 million cutoffs of water for people who couldn't pay. And there are 31 million people in Europe who don't have basic sanitation. So it's not just in the global south, although it does tend to be, of course, much worse um, in the global south. And I want to say that I do want to quickly make a distinction between the water crisis and the climate crisis. They are deeply linked, of course. Um, the, the climate crisis makes the water crisis worse, but I would also say vice versa. But if we were to stop every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow, we would still have a, a water crisis. So I want us to think about it to an extent separately. Um, so that's the situation going into COVID. So enter, enter COVID. Uh, and the thing we're all told is you have to wash your hands, warm water and soap, and you have to keep your, your body and your environment clean, like, you know, the things that come into your house, food or uh, whatever, you know, you have to keep it as clean as possible. Well, it turns out on World Water Day, just this past March 22nd, the UN said that there are more than, it's more than half the population of the world that doesn't have a place to go to wash their hands with warm water and soap. 
So they're starting with an absolutely incredible um, uh, handicap uh, in terms of dealing with this most dreadful um, virus. Uh, and depending on which set of studies you look at, anywhere between a quarter and a half of all the healthcare facilities in the global south don't have running water. So you imagine trying to deal with that anyway, and then along comes uh, the COVID crisis. I mean, the examples are so many. 21 major cities in India are in water crisis. There's 36 million people in Mexico without access to clean water. So try to imagine the COVID arriving on top of that. Um, like some people like to say it's an equal opportunity virus. We're all in this together. Well, actually, no. I saw nicely put that somebody said it, we're in the same rough waters, but we have different boats. And some people have no boat at all or boats that are just leaking um, into these rough waters. So if you're starting off poor or disadvantaged without access to water, without access to good food, you're already in uh, in a crisis that that uh, many people are uh, in better circumstances are, are, are not are not in. So what's happening is that governments and aid agencies are scrambling now to deal with the water crisis as they're dealing with the COVID crisis. Um, there's been some real progress. Argentina, Spain, Zambia, and good parts of the U.S. have all outlawed uh, water disconnections from for the time of COVID. Others such as South Africa and Indonesia have brought in new legislation saying that, you know, because they want to meet the COVID crisis, they're um, scrambling to bring in new water uh, programs. And we have uh, aid agencies absolutely um, turning their priority towards um, the, the water crisis. So it's the, Andy, the, the question you put was a very good one. COVID is making the water, put it one way, the, put it both ways, COVID is making the water crisis worse and the water crisis is making the COVID crisis worse. However, the good news here is that we are learning that governments can make a difference. And when governments decide to come together and fight a common threat, they can do it and they can put enormous resources to it. And now we know that, and we know that the COVID crisis and the water crisis go together. We have to come at them um, together almost as one crisis and really, it is um, a, a healthcare crisis as well. It always has been. More children die of waterborne disease than all forms of, of, uh, of uh, violence, including, uh, including war. So, I mean, it's already a huge pandemic. And, and then we have this other pandemic. So the, the COVID crisis has laid bare the water crisis. And I, I, I've, I'm hopeful that I'm, I'm, and I'm hearing around the world and in contact with so many um, communities around the world that governments are acting and understanding what we're saying. And, and it's important to remember that 10 years ago, this coming July, the United Nations General Assembly uh, adopted a resolution basically acknowledging a water and, and uh, sanitation are fundamental human rights. So it's not okay to watch your child die of waterborne disease because you don't have money to pay. It's not okay. And we said that as a human family. And there are obligations on governments about what that actually means. So now is the time to step up. We have to end uh, disconnections with people for people who cannot pay. We have to fulfill that pledge of, of water and sanitation for all. We have to, uh, governments have to absorb unpaid bills. There are many millions who are, are suddenly unable to pay their water bills. Um, we have to subsidize water services, but we have to keep water services in public hands. It's just crucial that we keep democratic control of our water services. Water is not like running shoes or, you know, uh, watches or whatever. Water is a human right. Water is a, a human need. You need it for life. And it's a fundamental public service. And it is crucial that we maintain a public and democratic control. So if there's any, and the United Nations, by the way, tells us that it's only 1% of the global GDP that it would cost to provide water and sanitation for all. So I, I, if any good can come from this um, terrible crisis, it's going to be that we are all going to stand back and say, we can't let what it was before be again, inequality, injustice, poverty, um, you know, water injustice, the, this, this situation. Um, and uh, and this assault on the environment, I think a, a lot of people around the world are saying, I want to come out of this differently. I don't need the things I needed before. I, I, I want a different world. And 
addressing this is going to be, has to be a priority because this won't be the last pandemic that's gonna come at us. And we have to be able to meet it in a way that our poorest and most vulnerable aren't the ones dying. Thank you so much. Unmute myself and say thank you uh, for that statement. And uh, Robert, um, it's your turn. Invite you. Thank you so much. And you know, it's really an honor to be here and be able to talk with, uh, be on the same platform with, with Maude and Ms. Barlow. And, and really, I want to thank the folks at the Right Livelihood Foundation, the Right Livelihood College for putting this together. It's really a valuable service for all of us to be having these discussions. Um, and it's great that we're able to do it and, and be able to get together in this way with modern technology like this. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for putting this together. Um, you know, uh, the, the issue with water, obviously we, uh, we're, we're dealing with not only the, the access to have water, but what about the water that we're actually drinking? Um, and I think that this particular um, crisis that we're dealing with right now with the virus is really highlighting, um, I, I think, the concern that we all have about what's in our water um, that, we're, that we're actually getting. For those of us here, for example, in the United States, I think most people here would think this isn't a problem for us. We have water. We have, we have clean, we have the, this is the U.S. We have the, you know, we turn the tap on and we have access to water. We have, this isn't a problem we have to deal with. But the problem is what's in the water. Um, and it's not just in the United States, but all over the world. Um, and you know, one of the things we have to think about, you know, we're talking about, for example, a virus that all of us right now are trying our best to avoid being exposed to something. You know, trying to do everything we can to avoid being exposed to something that might make us sick, might make us very sick. Um, um, and here in, in a number of places across the world, we have water that is contaminated and we know it's got contaminants in it that will make us sick. Uh, for example, one of the, the, the issues I've been dealing with over the last 20 years um, is with this family of chemicals you heard mentioned here at the beginning of the program, PFAS, PFAS chemicals that have managed to find their way into drinking water supplies all over the planet. Um, not only throughout the United States, where there are some 100 million people that are estimated to be exposed to these chemicals in their drinking water, but these chemicals have managed, managed to find their way into water supplies throughout Europe, throughout Australia, throughout New Zealand, and essentially everywhere that's being tested is, is almost, almost every place is now finding one or more of these PFAS chemicals in the water. And it's a great concern uh, because these are chemicals that have a number of different effects on us, including, uh, most disturbingly, for, in the context of the current situation where we're dealing with a virus, is the, the ability of PFAS chemicals to reduce uh, our ability of our immune system to fight off viruses and disease. That's one of the things that the researchers right now are most concerned about with this family of chemicals is the ability to decrease immune system response. And in fact, some of the most recent studies that have been done with this family of chemicals have linked exposure to these to decreased effectiveness of vaccines in children. You know, and so you think about this, you put it in context, here we're all being encouraged to, to, to stay home, you know, to be using our tap water to be using it as, as often as we can, to be washing our hands. And um, we're all probably drinking a lot more of the tap water than we used to when we were out in, in other areas. Um, and, we've, and there are so many places across the country that have these chemicals in the water that are actually potentially decreasing our immune system response or decreasing our ability to, to fight off infections and disease. Um, and so it's, it's really highlighting, I think, if anything, not only do we need water, we need obviously, we, we absolutely have to have access to drinking water, but we have to have access to the clean drinking water. It has to be free from these man-made toxins that we know have the ability to, to be linked with disease and to be causing um, all kinds of health problems. Um, 
you know, these are chemicals that we know have gotten into the blood of almost every person on the planet already. They're already there and we're continuing to be exposed. And so I think if anything, I, I'm hoping that we're seeing a really heightened awareness um, around safety of our drinking water and the concern that we be understanding exactly what's in our water. You know, in here in the United States, most people just assume when we turn that tap, you know, that somebody has already made sure that it's perfectly safe and that if we're drinking this water, there's no, nothing to be concerned about, that there are government entities and agencies that have, have studied all of this and made sure everything is perfectly safe. And unfortunately, the, the reality is uh, there are uh, relatively few uh, chemicals or contaminants that are actually sampled for or analyzed in, in our drinking water. Um, and there are a number of these additional compounds out there like PFAS uh, that have made their way into our water supply that, that frankly, um, most, most people don't know are there because they simply haven't been tested for or analyzed for. Um, and what we've really seen within the last year or two is uh, something I've been greatly encouraged by. Um, you know, events like what Right Livelihood Foundation has sponsored, you know, discussions about these kinds of, of issues have really, I think, started to highlight and, and bring increased awareness among folks to say, we need to know more about what's actually in our water. We need to understand how the, how the processes are set to analyze what's going into our drinking water, whether it's safe, how are those standards actually set to determine whether something is safe to be in our water? Uh, who's setting those standards? You know, who is actually generating the science that's being used to make these decisions? Um, who's actually the behind setting these standards? Uh, and to really start thinking a lot more critically about that entire system of identifying what goes into our water, uh, analyzing the safety of it, setting the standards, and uh, you know, just the, the entire system that's involved, the regulatory side, the scientific side, the legal side, you know, whether or not communities that have been exposed to these chemicals uh, have the right to go in and ask that their water be cleaned up, to actually get steps to be taken to stop the ongoing contamination, to require the health studies to be done, to tell us exactly what they might do to us, um, and really demand that steps be taken to look critically at those systems and demand that they be changed, you know, to keep, the, to keep up with what we know scientifically now about what's in the water and what needs to be done. And you know, I'm really uh, thankful for uh, opportunities like this to have these discussions and to have people really start thinking critically about um, what's in the water, how we go about making sure it's safe and how we go about making sure that it's not increasing our susceptibility to disease and viruses um, and to really make sure that um, we understand exactly um, how the systems are, are in place that are setting these safety standards and what we need to do to improve it and fix it. And again, I really thank, uh, thank you all for setting up this opportunity to have this discussion and particularly uh, happy to be able to, to do it in the context of the Right Livelihood Foundation, the Right Livelihood College. So thank you. Thank you to uh, both of you. And uh, before we go on, let me remind listeners that you can submit questions to Maud, to Robert, um, to, and here is the email address again, rlc-webinar at ucsc.edu. So um, we have put some minutes aside for the two of you to, um, begin a conversation with each other, ask each other questions, uh, make comments about uh, your initial presentations. Uh, so um, if either of, of you would like to start that, um, now is the right opportunity to do it. Well, I'll start if I could, um, just to say <clears throat> Robert's work is incredibly important and uh, Americans and people around the world owe him a great deal um, for his exposure of this incredibly damaging um, uh, family of chemicals. 
Um, there are other chemicals, of course, Robert well knows. Um, one study that I read um, from the United States was that 87% of North American, or the chemicals that we find on North American shelves have not been given approval by, um, certainly in our country, by I'm Canadian, by our government. And I know we're, we're allowing uh, materials into our water in North America that are banned in Europe. So, you know, there are, when governments decide that they want to protect the health of their people and the, and the, the, the water itself, um, they can do that. I wanted just to make a couple of, of, of comments. One is that this could be part, like when I talked about the human right to water and then, and then the, you know, linking it with poverty, but linking it with health and the right to, the, the right, and Robert I know talks about the right to to clean blood. I mean that you're, you know, that this, these chemicals aren't in your in your body. Um, this must be part of of what we come out of with this. If if governments can come together to to uh, you know to, to have this massive response to the COVID crisis, which you know we all know is a terrible threat to the economy, but the health health of people comes first, then we can do this on other fronts. That there's no reason we shouldn't be having much stricter uh, testing and protecting of our water. Uh, and I, I, I feel that this could be something that we that could be one of the very clear demands um, coming out of, of this crisis. It's just not going back there. And you know, other times when, when public water systems were put in, when wastewater and sewage systems were put in, it was often because people realized people with the power to do something, the more, I guess, more political elite realized that if you didn't do it for everybody, nobody ended up being safe. So in, in a way, the health threat here helps us to argue um, for, for um, better, you know, better health services, including uh, clean water. I do want to make um, a caution around thinking, and I, and I know Robert shares this, um, uh, that the bottled water is a, a better solution because, of course, these chemicals are found in bottled water as well. Many of the, much of the bottled water you get is just tap water anyway um, that's gone through an osmosis process but it, it's not touching the, the chemicals that, that Robert's talking about and I worry very much that people are hoarding bottled water they're thinking somehow the COVID virus is is, is being um, transmitted through water and so there's been a lot of hoarding and we know that uh, something like this year a half a trillion uh, bottles of plastic water are, are bought and sold. That's a million um, of plastic bottles of water every minute. And it's ending up in our landfills and in our oceans and our, in, our, in our lakes and rivers and so on. So we need to clean the water up and not say, well, we won't worry about public water. We'll, we'll turn to our private water because it's, it's no safer. But I, I, I do, I, I, maybe it's just the perennial optimist in me, but I want to see something come out of this that makes us better as humans, that makes us care about the things that matter, the health of our young people, the health of our environment, um, we can do better. And Robert has shown us the way on, in this particular case. Well, you know, I, I think you, you've made some ter tremendous points here and you know, the, the, the entire concept that you've been so eloquent about, you know, the, the right to clean water, <laughs> the right to drinking water, that, that should be a human right. I mean, nobody at this point seems to be questioning that we shouldn't be exposed to a virus, you know, that there should be steps taken immediately to protect people from that because it might make them sick, you know, and or it might make very serious health consequences. Yet there still seems to be this resistance to thinking that people have a right also to have clean water and not to have these poisons put into their body. Yet in, in those situations, You've got this, you still have this concept, definitely at least in the United States, that you first, well, you have to prove that that's making you sick first, or you have to prove that there's really something harmful yet. And let's wait and see if you get sick. Let's, let's wait and see if you get you know, something like the virus before we, we, we take action. Instead of just recognizing we have a right to have clean water. We have a right not to have these things put into our body we shouldn't have to be the ones proving that these are harmful. You know, I don't see anybody out there saying we have to prove that this virus is actually going to make you this sick or actually do these things to you. It's accepted, that's a given. We understand that makes sense. People shouldn't be exposed to something like this that will make them sick. 
yet we still seem to have this mindset that that's acceptable though, if it's conveyed to you through your water or if it's conveyed to you through getting it into your blood, that that's acceptable somehow. So I agree that if, if we can at least have, if, if this helps us have this discussion, you know, that there are certain things that ought to be seen as protected rights, that these are things that everyone should share and that people shouldn't have to come in and somehow prove in a court of law that they have the right to water, they have the right to clean water, that that should be accepted. Um, you know, if we to, to at least be able to elevate that discussion and start having those discussions, even here in the United States, um, you know, and now's the time to be doing that. And, and it's, I, I really thank uh, Maude for being able to be here and, and re reminding us that these are not, you know, this is not uniformly accepted that there's a right to clean water. At least, you know, in the United States, that's still seen as you have to prove that your water's not first dirty and you have to prove that it's dirty uh, above a certain level before you can do anything about it. It's, it's not accepted that you should just generally have this right, which most of us would assume we all agree with that. Um, so anything we can do to, to elevate that discussion and continue it, um, it, it's just, I think it's tremendous that we're able to have that opportunity to do it. That's great. And Andy, just a couple of thoughts just to, to, to trigger uh, that, that Robert's um, triggered for me. One is this, this you're, what you're talking about, of course, is the precautionary principle, mm -hmm. which is that before a product comes to market, you, it, it is the onus is on the manufacturer to prove that it's safe. Now it's basically the opposite. It's risk assessment. And uh, if they think, well, let's let, let, you know, there's I mean, let's face it, we know an awful lot of big corporations work really hand in hand with our governments and they give them lots of money. And when they say jump, the government sometimes oftentimes say how high. And we know they have power. I mean, of the 100 largest economies in the world, 69 are corporations, uh, you know, only 31 are countries. You know, Walmart's bigger than the GDP of most countries in the world. Um, don't even talk about Amazon, right? So we, we really, we need to understand the, the corporate power and, and what happens when somebody like Robert comes up and says, no, I'm, you know, it takes somebody to stand up to them. But unless that's happening, in, in this case, it did happen. But in many cases, it doesn't. Governments, are, by and large, are not saying, um, you know, this is the way it must be. So I, I want to say that in terms of, the um, the notion of the human right to water, it was a huge fight. Uh, it was 10 years ago this July, July 28th, I was in the United Nations General Assembly up on the balcony with some of my staff and they were in tears because we thought we were going to lose. <clears throat> my country, Canada, led the fight against the human right to water and sanitation. I am embarrassed to this day. The US was opposed then. The United States under Obama changed its position, but at the time uh, was opposed. Um, Great Britain was opposed. Australia was opposed. Most of the English, the what you would call neoliberal governments were opposed, right? Uh, and a lot at the World Bank was opposed, the big water companies, the big utilities, the big bottled water companies, of course they were opposed. Nobody wants to have this named a human right. Um, we won, 141 countries voted in favor and none of the countries, including Canada that had, a, had opposed it, had the nerve to vote against it. They abstained, which I thought was cowardly. You know, you, don't, you, know, you know you're not supporting it. Don't be, don't play games here, but all the countries in the world now have adopted it. It is a UN resolution, but that, that was a real fight. And it, it, you, you think, how can it be a question that the water, that everyone has a right to clean water or as Robert says, that the water coming out of your tap is clean. So that's the last point I wanna make here. And that, that is when that resolution was adopted um, in July, uh, uh, 10 years ago this July, Two months later, the Human Rights Council laid out a very clear plan of what that meant. What does it mean, the right to water? What does the right to sanitation mean? And they said there are three obligations placed on all governments around this. Number one, the right to the obligation to fulfill. If you have people who don't have, or communities that don't have water and sanitation, it's your responsibility to provide it. Number two, you can't remove it once it's been provided. So the cutoffs in places like um, Detroit and 
Baltimore and all the inner cities where there's been huge, these huge water cutoffs, that's against the United Nations uh, resolution, which the United States and other countries have all adopted now. But the third, and this is where Robert's work comes in, is that gov the governments are obliged to protect the local water sources. So the people's local water sources are safe to drink. In other words, it isn't just the notion of poor people who don't have any access to water. It's, it's um, you can't contaminate the local water sources that people need. So when we're talking about fracking or mining uh, or you know many of the extractive industries and the, the poison that they leave behind, um, governments are, res are, are responsible for not allowing that to happen. Now, do they? Of course they do. But I, I, it's important that people know that there are these international obligations that our governments have adopted. And they really do not only address the injustice and poverty issue, but they, uh, they um, ad address the quality of water issue too. And it's, I think it's really important we start pushing for that as part of this notion as the, of the human right to water, human right to water uncontaminated. Uh, by PFAs or anything else. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think the more we can discuss that and the fact that 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 exists, as you just described, you know, that that history. I think most people here, particularly in the U.S., don't know about that. You know, yeah. don't don't realize that that was adopted. <laughs> you know, that that was approved. Um, and there's been, you know, there's in the legal world here just very little, you know, recognition of that. Uh, that 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 exists and that should be enforced and that should be upheld. Um, so the more we can do to talk about that and to bring awareness of that, um, you know, that's that's tremendous that we can get that discussion going here. Yeah, let me observe that this whole kind of framing of rights uh, is particularly powerful, I think, in the United States because you know it's it's kind of in our DNA to, uh, to think that, you know, the country was founded on some uh, bedrock notions of what any human being has a right to expect uh, from their society uh, to be entitled to, to be protected from. And so I think that that can resonate with people here um, and, and certainly elsewhere as well. Quite controversial, as we know from the people running for the Democratic nomination uh, are arguing about whether health care is a, a, a right uh, or is instead a commodity that some people can purchase and maybe other people less so. Uh, let me ask a couple of questions uh, before we move on to questions from our listeners. Uh, uh, Maud, um, I wonder if you could comment about um, governments around the world having different capacities or will uh, to uh, address public health issues. Uh, you know, I, I think that when you look at uh, analyses of, of climate adaptation, for example, um, there's documents you can find online that show vast differences in uh, different national governments uh, uh, not just recognition that there's a problem, but their, but their capacity administratively, bureaucratically to address uh, issues like that. So uh, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about your perception about uh, different uh, capabilities and willingness to protect water access and quality. Well, of course, this is the key issue, isn't it? If you live in certain Countries or even in very poor countries is usually a wealthy class that can buy all the water at once for swimming pools and whatever else. Um, and by the way, I want to be very clear that the human right to water and sanitation doesn't mean you have all the right, all the water you want for anything you want. It's very, very clearly laid out by the Human Rights Council. It's, it's to make, it's to meet basic needs. We're not talking about you know, a free for all uh, so that people waste water. That's, that's not at all what we're talking about. But yes, we have totally uh, different realities in, in many countries. And of course it's linked to um, intensity of population, um, migrants, people living in, um, in refugee camps or, or inform what they call informal camps, uh, um, slums which haven't been recognized and therefore the government's saying, well, we don't have to provide water to them. Um, so it gets linked up, of course, with many, many issues around poverty and injustice and racial injustice. 
Um, and what we find, and this has been a huge part of my work, is that when many times with governments working with their alongside their corporate leaders, they take the limited water sources that are there and they put them to economic benefits. They get they shoot convert them to industrial farming or to mining. They let mining companies do whatever they want to the local water or they send it to the, the free trade zones or whatever. And so the people and the small villages and, the, and the, the, the indigenous communities don't get it or it gets taken away from them or their water gets poisoned. So this becomes part of not only the issue of different capabilities of governments around the world, but a very unjust system. And I would argue that we've had 30 years of leaders around the world telling us hand all the decisions over to the market and everybody will be better or the you know the tide will rise and all boats will rise with it which of course isn't true at all um, and i would argue that in a world where three quarters of the work, world's working age population are in what they call the precariat which means they don't have job security they don't have decent wages they don't have pensions they don't you know some of them, many, many people around the world have two or three jobs. I was at a conference years ago and, and somebody joked and said, oh, George Bush has created lots of jobs. I myself have three of them, right? So in, in that kind of a world, um, of course we have uh, the 1% or the 10% or whatever you want to call it at the top and, and it's getting worse. And then we, on top of that, and this is my other sort of big area of work, is that we impose these trade agreements on governments or governments impose them on themselves or the rich governments impose them on everybody. And they constrain what, go what, what, what um, governments can do in terms of regulating on their behalf of their people or on protecting their environment and natural resources. One of the big issues that we have is with this thing called ISDS, the investment investor state um, settlement uh, dispute settlement which is where corporations are given the right to bypass their government where they're located and lay a charge against, a challenge against a, a government of another country if they feel that their environmental laws or their human rights laws or whatever are getting in the way of their profit. So we've skewed a system in many ways. And, it, and then as we, as the population grows, um, as these water sources become so scarce, as we see water as a resource for us, and, you know, our pleasure and profit as opposed to being the living element that gives us all life. As we, as we, as we create that kind of world, of course, we've got inequality. We've got inequality between nations. We've got inequality within nations. So this fight for water justice has right. to take place uh, against a larger tableau of looking at international policies, national policies, what matters to, to our governments, how much power these corporations have. We, we have to challenge that um, while we work and, and really understand that, that, that we're going to have to also, and this is another lesson from COVID, we can't say it's okay for us here, but we'll let those people die. It just simply can't be like that. And, and that's another tough lesson from COVID. Great. Right, thank you. Uh, Robert, let me ask you this question. Um, you know, the last time that I studied regulation of uh, hazardous materials in, uh, in the water, uh, which was back in about 2007 or so, uh, I kept seeing that Congress kept acknowledging uh, that there were um, more chemicals in tap water typically in the US then were being tested or regulated and ordered uh, further research uh, so that perhaps chemicals, more chemicals would be listed as uh, needing to be regulated, needing to be removed from the public water supply. And my impression at the time was that uh, timelines kept being pushed back um, that the testing uh, capacity of the laboratories in the U.S. was insufficient, uh, that there was an intention to learn more about uh, contaminants in the public water supply, but that things were lagging seriously. And that was during an era where environmental regulations were, uh, let's, let's not say enthusiastically being enforced, but at least being acknowledged. And uh, there have been other times, other administrations where environmental protection is neglected or uh, uh, is you know, treated as something that's undesirable. 
And I wonder if you can, you know, uh, in a couple of minutes that we have left, say something about uh, the kind of long term, like what has happened to the regulation of water uh, contaminants in water in the past 10 years or so? Sure. You know, you, you've hit on a, a really important area, you know, and we're really talking about a real systemic problem here with the way in which regulations are set. Uh, for drinking water contaminants, at least in the United States, it, it's an extremely long, cumbersome, complex process. Um, and the, the situation with PFAS has been used as a classic example of um, to really illustrate the problems with that system and um, how it doesn't work and, and how it needs to be changed. And, and this is something that has transcended different administrations, different political parties. Uh, it's been going on for decades and decades since the, the programs first came into, the, into existence. You know, after the US EPA came out in 1970 and some of these regulatory programs started to follow in the late 70s, you know, for the process for setting regulations in the United States on drinking water contaminants um, has so many steps and so complex of a process. You know, with, with PFAS, for example, you know, I, I first sent a letter to the US EPA in 2001, alerting the agency that, hey, there's this chemical out there that might have gone sort of un, unnoticed for a while that probably should have drinking water standards. And naively thought that would jumpstart the process. The EPA would jump in and start setting regulatory standards. And what, what we saw through that process was how long that takes because what we heard was, well, we have to have more data about what the potential human health effects would be from this contaminant being in the water. And we've got these animal studies, but we don't have enough human data yet. So we jumped in and through litigation, tried to get those human data, that human data, um, that, that data gap plugged, did some of the most massive human health studies ever done you know, showing the link between this particular chemical PFOA in drinking water and six different diseases, including two types of cancer, went back to the US EPA at that point in 2012 and said, all right, now you have this massive set of data, not only the toxicology data, the, the animal study data showing all of these uh, risks and effects from your risk assessment, but we now have the human data as well supporting that. What else do we need now to move that process forward? And it was only at that point that the EPA then went to this next step of saying, well, now we have to decide whether or not this is a contaminant that is even a national problem. Is it a nationally occurring problem, one that the US EPA will address on a federal level, or do we just leave this to the states because it's a, it only occurs in, in certain areas? So at that point, the US EPA added these chemicals to the unregulated contaminant monitoring program which for the first time required the water, the, the people that supply drinking water to start sampling for the chemical. That's 2013, 2014. So they started finally sampling to see, is this chemical even occurring in water supplies across the US? That data finally comes in and shows sure enough, it is occurring throughout the US. And since that point, we finally get the EPA, had to go back at this point, about 10 years had passed, since they had first started looking at it and trying to come up with risk assessments, they had to go back and then update their risk assessments. And they finally came out with their first guideline for the chemical in drinking water in 2016 and said at that point, they adopted an action plan shortly after that, that they would move forward to begin actually regulating and setting standards for this chemical in the drinking water. It's now been three, four years since then and it still hasn't happened because we, all, of, all of these steps, the next step is the agency then has to make a regulatory determination based on all of this data about whether it's something they will regulate or not. And they just did that. Just, la just a, a couple months ago, they finally came out with their regulatory determination that yes, these are chemicals that we intend to regulate, but that just gets us to this next step. And then the agency has to actually develop the regulation. And that has to go out for public comment and then feedback. So this process is going to take at least another five, six years. So, you know, you put this in context. 
Here we have a chemical that we know is in drinking water all over the United States. Over 100 million people have been estimated to be drinking this right now or be exposed to it in their water. It's been definitively linked with all kinds of serious diseases in animal studies. Also now with human data as well, the risk assessment process has, has been done. We, we see what the risk levels are. We've got this data. We now know it's everywhere in the water, yet we still can't get it actually added to the regulatory list in the United States because of this process that's been set up that is so slow, so cumbersome. Right. And unfortunately, what people were left with was then the legal process. They had to hire people, lawyers, and I'm a lawyer, I'll be the first one to tell you that's not the way it should work. People shouldn't have to go get a lawyer to go in and get their water cleaned up and to get their water to be safe. They shouldn't have to go into the court. Yet in the US, because of this complex, slow grinding process to set regulatory standards for drinking water, that's what people are left with. And we're just now seeing demands at the federal level for the first time, you know, that let's just jumpstart that. Let's just go and actually set standards by legislation that these chemicals should be dealt with in the drinking water. Because people are tired of that. Very long process, and that was a long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. It's exactly what we needed to understand because you're exactly right. It it takes so long from the initial uh, warnings that something is threatening uh, public health to uh, the point where there is effective regulation. You know, and unfortunately, uh, you've got during that time. People are being exposed every day Absolutely. while that process Absolutely. goes on. Right. We're, we're all uh, guinea pigs in a vast, uh, uncontrolled experiment about what the human body can absorb and what it can't. And uh, every baby should be sent home uh, from the hospital with uh, having put the X on the little release form. Like, yes, I'm willing to uh, be a guinea pig in, in this particular uh, human experiment. Um, you guys are so interesting and so so much fun. I guess fun is maybe not the right word uh, to uh, listen to. Uh, so we are kind of running a little low on time and I'm looking at the questions that have been sent in, many good questions, uh, most of which we won't be able to uh, pose for you. But I wanna focus in on one specifically and I'll read you the question and then expand on it. Uh, the question is, do you have suggestions of organizations who are on the front lines of fighting the water crisis that young adults entering the field of water policy and management should have on their radar? And uh, if, it would be great if you spoke to that specifically and sort of what kinds of uh, careers there are, what kind of organizations there are where people could find a, a home as activists. Uh, but more broadly, I also want to ask, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing environmental sociology for about 40 years now. And uh, it took a long time to come to a very simple conclusion, which is that social movements are the thing that really push things forward. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you could identify or talk about particular organizations or movements, both in the US and worldwide, that you are particularly encouraged by and hopeful for and hope to see uh, grow in the next period. Ahmad? Well, maybe I'll start. Um, just I'm assuming that <clears throat> the majority of people joining us are from the United States. I may be wrong, but so I'll just say for the US, <clears throat> um, I, I really recommend Food and Water Watch um, is a very, uh, a very, very dynamic organization. I'm on the board, so uh, full disclosure here, um, although I'm Canadian, but it's a, a really, really wonderful organization fighting for safe food, um, safe conditions for growing food for farmers, um, and um, safe, clean public water for all. Um, and you go to their website, particularly I would lead you to the, their promotion of uh, an act called the Water Act. Um, and the Water Act is, you know, it's had several iterations, but I think really there is beginning to be serious movement on it now. And I think this could be, again, COVID could be something that pushes it forward. 
Um, in Canada <clears throat> or internationally, we have started uh, years ago something called the Blue Planet Project. The Blue Planet Project is um, kind of a coordinating body for the international water justice work. Um, we've been promoting something we call Blue Communities and a Blue Community <clears throat> started just in Canada and started just with municipalities but has expanded to other countries and to institutions like universities and schools, faith-based uh, organizations and so on and it's where but starting with municipalities where a municipality says we're going to protect water as a human right. So what does that mean in my community? We're going to um, protect it as a public good. So it's not, we're not going to allow it to be privatized. Uh, the water service is privatized and we're going to phase out bottled water um, on municipal premises and at municipal events and so on. Um, the, we have a number in, in Canada, a number of Europe, in Europe, but um, Los Angeles just a few months ago became first major blue community in the United States. And we're really hoping that uh, takes off. And if you think, well, Los Angeles, surely that everybody has water. Well, no, there are about a million people without access to water and sanitation in the, in the uh, greater Los Angeles area. Uh, and so that commitment is a really um, in, in important one. And they also made a commitment to start talking about phasing out bottled water at the airport. <laughs> Uh, the Los Angeles airport, which, you know, if we start thinking about uh, if we have the right to safe public clean, you know, safe again, I say water, there's no reason that we should be drinking this stuff in plastic, which adds to the chemical poisoning of, of, our, of our planet. Um, and so, uh, you know, that would be a place to go come to our, our website, um, Blue Planet Project, go to Food and Water Watch if you're in the US you will see a list of other organizations depending on what country you live in. Um, but you're right, um, Andy, social movements are where it's at. I mean, you it comes from the bottom up sometimes in a case like Roberts, it's one person who said, I just will not budge. But you need people behind you, you need a movement behind you and, and to, to get the human right to water and sanitation recognized by the United Nations took the work of many, many thousands, I would say millions of people around the world who just worked tirelessly. Uruguay became the first country in the world um, in 1994, I think, to become, uh, to, to name water as a human right. And they had, uh, had has got several million signatures. They had a referendum by law. If they got a certain number, it had to go to their government, their parliament. Um, they brought this, the petition in, in the form of on the long ribbons of blue ribbons like this of uh, looking like a wave. Um, it, it was in incredible. I mean, people just care. They care about local water. It's really important. And they care when they find out what Robert and others are telling them that your water, you know, that you think is safe, isn't safe. You have a right to, to save water. You have, we all have this fundamental right. And I think that when that happens to a community, magic things happen. We stop pipelines that are going to go through. We stop mining companies that are, are contaminating our water. People come together and say, maybe you'll do this, 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 and this. But as a, the leader of a, a big water fight in Cochabamba, Bolivia, uh, Oscar Oliveira said to me, because they, they, the World Bank had brought in a private company. It was not only tripling the price of water for the largely indigenous poor community, but they said, we own the water coming from the sky. <laughs> the people said, I don't think so. And they took to the streets and there was a revolution and people were killed. It was a real water war. And I said to him, how did you get the courage to take on the army and the World Bank? And he said, and I'll always remember this, because I'd rather die of a bullet than thirst. We need to understand this is life and death. And it's life and death in our own even wealthier communities where the water we're drinking isn't safe. We have, uh, these are fundamental rights and we, and when you learn that right, you go on to others. It's a wonderful world into the, into the world of uh, social movement politics and social movements. Robert, do you have some comments? Sure. Um, you know, obviously, as a lawyer, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of any clients today. This is, these are my personal views and my, my personal opinion. But you know, there are a number of groups uh, that I know are out there working right now in this in this area, particularly with respect to contaminants in water and trying to increase awareness and understanding of what these are and uh, what's being done and what can be done by different community organizations. With the film Dark Waters that came out recently, there was an organization 
that was formed among a lot of these different community groups and organizations and environmental groups called fightforeverchemicals.com, for example, where you can link up with these different organizations across the country and across the world that are working on this. You know, groups like the Environmental Working Group, Green Science Policy Institute, Center for Environmental Health, Safer States, or, uh, Toxics Action Network. There are a number of different organizations out there that are, that are trying to make information available about um, you know, chemical contamination in water, how you can get involved in it, how you can work within your community, um, how you can link up and, and try to access information that these other communities may have um, and be able to work together and, and try to elevate awareness and, and really um, you know, be able to, 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 to bring greater attention to all of these communities but through a, a linked network. So I would encourage people to try to check that out. And, and you know, it, there's, there's always a place um, you know, available for folks, particularly like you indicated before, you know, it just takes one person standing up and speaking out. And um, you know, even more powerful when you can get your community involved in these different communities being linked up together, um, you know, is, is I think a tremendous power. Well, um, I see that it's uh, 9 a.m. and we've used up our whole allotted time. Uh, David um, sent me a little note if you guys are willing to do a couple of extra minutes. Um, are you? Sure. You can ask me one more question. Um, so there are a number of people asked a much more specific question about uh, um, coronavirus uh, lurking in uh, drinking water, uh, ocean water. Uh, do either one of you, I know this is a stretch, um, but do either one of you have any, uh, uh, looked at any scientific findings or studies that uh, look at, you know, people are, you know, understand that it's person to person uh, particles in the air which is the major form of transmission. Uh, anything out there about uh, transmission through um, contact through water? Not that I, I have not looked into that. I'm not sure. I have okay. <clears throat> all I've read. I'm not a doctor or a scientist. I have read that the, there is absolutely no way that water uh, carries the COVID virus. Uh, so I think I would uh, encourage your the people asking the question to Google that um, because I there have been expert statements on saying that the water the water is safe from that it may not be safe from the chemicals that that Robert's talking about. Yeah, the only thing that I've seen is a, a initial um, notice from the CDC that um, pool water people use it for lap swimming uh, yes. since it's treated. Yes. with uh, chemicals not, is not okay, but, but it wasn't definitive. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's they, wrap things up. In a pool with other people, there's also the airborne, like it's hard to know. Right. Yeah, it's right. the, the drinking right. water I understand is. is right. Uh, this, so the, the virus has some of the same qualities that uh, Rachel Carson identified in Silent Spring, uh, the invisible poison rain. Uh, which is threatening not be, be exactly because your senses fail you. You don't know if you're putting yourself at risk. Therefore, uh, the whole environment uh, could potentially be at risk, uh, which, which makes for pretty, particularly rational forms of paranoia, I think, uh, that uh, human beings uh, are not well prepared in terms of their regular cognitive and perceptual apparatus to, to cope with really well. Um, so um, let's take a couple of minutes if you each want to uh, share some final thoughts, uh, perhaps uh, telling us how you plan to operate in a pandemic world. Uh, are you gonna be changing what you do or uh, soldiering on? Um, uh, what do you see as the, you know, Take a, maybe a couple of minutes to tell us uh, what what you're going to do next, and what we should be thinking about doing next. 
Well, <clears throat> maybe I'll start just to say again, thank you to, to everyone who put this on and everyone who's been part of it. Um, <clears throat> I would like to see the environment, uh, protection of water, protection of air, protection of our soils to become as, to be, take, to be put on the same plane as, as the COVID. Uh, for all of us, for our governments, for our leaders, um, for you know, we come out of this with an understanding uh, that change has to happen, and I will be doing whatever I, it is that I can to make that happen. I mean, what we've read is that people are, uh, some people are actually living because the Scott, the air is cleaned up. And you know, we just read one study in, from London, England. Um, but the sky's over Europe, the sky's over India, they can see the Himalayas. Uh, so what does that mean? What, you know, what, what, what are we doing with the environment that is so dangerous to our health and can we understand it? Can COVID be in its awful way a gift to us to make us understand that? Um, we'll be, our, my organizations will be adapting to the new reality and working with people as much as we can um, to walk us all through this. I particularly worry about young people and the profound changes that this is making to their lives, but can we come out of it with clearer values? Can we come out figuring out a better world? Because the, as I said earlier, not back to normal because normal was the problem in the first place. I think we can um, and uh, I'll be there as much as I can and, and so will so will my organization. So I just want to thank you all and particularly to young young people and students watching this. There's lots of room for hope. Hope is a, a moral imperative and uh, we'll all get through this and we'll get we'll, we'll come out the other side better people. Uh, Robert. Uh, incredibly well said. <laughs> that was fantastic and I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I, I can, I intend to continue doing what I've been doing, although it uh, probably is going to be occurring here from my basement or somewhere in the house. But, um, you know, we're going to try to continue to do what we can to increase awareness of these issues and increase understanding of the extent of the problem with you know, ongoing chemical contamination, not only of our water, but uh, of our blood as well. Um, and doing everything I can to help um, further that education and awareness from, from whatever I can do uh, in my capacity. And I um, um, really, really can't thank the folks enough that helped put this on and Ms. Barlow as well and others at the Right Livelihood Foundation for, for having these kinds of discussions and for all of those out there that are watching and um, you know, taking the interest in these kinds of issues. Uh, you know, I think it's everybody thinking about these things, being aware that these things are happening uh, and being able to then step forward and do something about it. Uh, so um, being able to have these kinds of discussions in, in, in this context um, is tremendous. And thank you for everybody that's that's been part of it. Well, thank you, Maude. Uh, thank you, Robert. And um, thank you for the invisible audience uh, that has been with us and listening to this conversation. And uh, please remember that the next webinar is going to be on May 13th with the topic, Current Threats to Democracy with Francis Moore LaPay and Vesna Terselic being our two speakers. So again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I hope that it has been a, a, a useful way to uh, spend this particular morning or wherever you are in the world. It could be afternoon, could be middle of the night. Uh, take care and goodbye. Thanks. Mm -hmm.